want to call your attention to the announcement that Steve gave earlier and give it an extra push a little bit with the Ladies' Day uh, with Beverly Ross coming. Beverly is a friend of mine. I've known her and her family for years, and she's a true woman of God, and she's preaching on developing a no matter what faith. Beverly has an incredible story that she's going to reveal a little bit on Saturday, but then also next Sunday, uh, I'm going to interview Beverly in our, our worship time together. And I, I promise there will not be a dry eye in, in, in the place. And she has this incredible testimony that I want you to hear. So ladies, it's $5. We're covering the, the cost of bringing her in, but it's just $5 for the meal. Take advantage of that. She's a true woman of God that uh, has an incredible story and a life worth emulating. Well, we're in our second week of our purpose statement. Making disciples to glorify God by loving Him and loving others. And with our leadership team coming up with this phrase, it's, it's a statement hopefully emulating who, who we, and encapsulating who we want to be and also what we want to be about as a fellowship. So it's important for us to work this into the culture here at Twickenham, for this to be something that, that we know and, and understand and, and can readily bring to our lips. Now, this is what we hope to, to be about as we, we work and minister within God's kingdom. Last week, we talked a little bit about the concept of making disciples. The idea that we're called to be in the presence of Jesus, to understand His life and His teachings, and understand uh, within our heart what He's done for us. And that if He were our teacher, our rabbi, that we're going to be walking so close to Him and spending so much time with Him that His dust is covering over us. We talked about that discipleship isn't just about you and Jesus, but it's also about making disciples of others, fulfilling the Great Commission in Matthew 28, that that dust that we're getting from being with Jesus in turn rubs off on those. And so we follow Paul's admonition to the Corinthians in chapter 11 and verse 1, follow me as I follow Jesus. It's a powerful, powerful verse that I hope each one of us can pro proclaim. So this week we move on to the, the second phrase in our purpose statement, glorifying God. And it's kind of a difficult concept to kind of wrap your, your mind around. In the mornings when I take my kids to the drive through at school, I, I, I always try to give them a, a little blessing. And so sometimes I'll, I'll say, uh, you know, I, I love you. You know, don't remember that he loves you. And then I'll also mix in something about achievement. You know, do your best, do your best. And, and I can kind of read what's going on when I say things like this. You know, it, it just registers that, you know, I was thinking about mailing it in today, but Dad, since you said that, boy, I'm going to give him an A game. You know, thanks, thanks, appreciate that. And so, you know, do your best. And sometimes if, if the preacher's saying, you know, glorify God, does it kind of fall into that same camp? You know, it, it sounds good. But how do we put that onto a to-do list? You know, take out the garbage, clear the dry cleaning, and glorify God. How do we do that? And so we've spent some time in our adult Bible fellowships and the teens as well discussing that all throughout Scripture we see this concept of, of glorifying God's name, the things He's doing and the calling of Abraham and all these things to bring glory into His name. But yet it becomes incumbent upon us to say, exactly how do we do that? How do we put that into our practice when we go to school, when we go to work, when we go out into the neighborhoods? So I, I want us for, for just a moment, if, if this were a movie, uh, you know, usually in the opening scene, you, you see some close-up action, and then there, the camera is actually mounted to a helicopter, and the helicopter just keeps going up. You start to see the bird's eye view, and it reminds you, you're not watching TV, you're watching a huge production. So what's the big production that we see in, in Scripture? Well, Scripture tells us from the dawn of creation in, in Psalms chapter 8, that the heavens, the moon, and the sun, all that God has created points to the Creator. And said, in, in fact, man has no excuse that it's in, 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 embedded w within all that God has done. I was reading a, a story about an atheist that, that said that he didn't believe in God until his daughter was born. He said one morning as he was kind of holding her up, he saw a stream of light come in and he saw just the intricacy of the blood vessels within her ear. And he said, that didn't happen by accident. And if someone created her, there must be a creator. And so from the dawn of creation, everything is pointing to our Heavenly Father. 
And as we continue on through, through Scripture, in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, the, the good prophet says, you think this is incredible. All of what God's done for His people, get ready. Because God's going to reveal His ultimate glory in the coming of Jesus Christ. And this ultimate glory will be revealed. So everything in, in Scripture has been leading up to the moment of the cross. And, and Jesus is going to talk about, and we'll talk about it in just a minute, that His glory, His purpose, all was leading to this. God revealing Himself, God in the flesh, coming down to, and, and dwelling among us. And finally, if we go all the way to the book of Revelation, and, Revel, and John talks about, the Apostle John talks about the end of times in this new Jerusalem, and how we see the fulfillment, the end of the story, how it's going to end up. And we have the Lamb and the Lord coming into this new temple. And that their glory is just so incredible, combining these two forces together, that there is no night there. And all the nations, the, the world leaders, will, will gather to, to participate in this glorious song. Revelation 21 and verse 24 says, The nations will walk by light, and the kings of earth will bring their splendor into it. So if, if, if this is what God has in mind, and if it's God's plan from the very beginning to the end for this chorus to come forth, how do we do this? How do we participate in this chorus? Three suggestions we're going to talk about this morning. There's three ways we can bring glory to God. One is with our lips. One is with our lives. And finally, with our legacy. Well, let's talk about lips. The praise that comes from our lips. If you have your Bibles, turn to me to Psalms chapter 96. Lincoln read some of this with the praise team earlier. Psalms chapter 96. Because if it's in God's mind and God's purpose that His glory and His name is going to be upheld so that all the nations can hear of the one true God and, and put aside their idols in order to worship Him around this great lake, and all the peoples of the earth come in together, what is our responsibility as those that are proclaiming His glory? Because Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, one way or another, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So how do we bring this about? Well, Psalms 96, starting in verse 1, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise His name. Proclaim His salvation, what He's done for you day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all the people. You know what God's done for you. And it is not just what happened on the cross. You know how your life has changed. You know what, man, this is the way I used to live. But because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is how my life is different. Let me tell you my story. Let me witness as to what God's done in my life. You may be able to argue about theology, but I, all I can tell you is my experience. That's got to get out there. We glorify God when we worship. We come together. We proclaim the, the name of Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, it just fills my soul to come and, and worship with the Twickenham family. I love how William James talks about it. We don't sing because we're happy. We're happy because we sing. So we get together and, and, and sing, especially in, in our tradition, where we're all worshiping together and, and all lifting up one voice and, and we're proclaiming God's glory. It does something to us. And then happiness and joy comes when we're in this sweet spot. We find ourselves worshiping together as a congregation and offering it up. But it goes beyond that. It goes beyond just worship. Each of us is called to give glory to God by sharing the tangible benefits and intangible blessings that we've received from God. So that's got to be ready. That's got to be something that we've thought about. That's something that we've experienced, that we've got on our heart that immediately can just kind of pour out. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, Peter encourages us. He said, if you're going to proclaim you're a Christian, if you're going to proclaim, I'm a Jesus follower, as your Lord, be ready to share the reason for your hope that you have in Him. It's not just, well, my wife wants me to go to church and so I kind of believe in Jesus. No, you've got to have a relationship with Jesus. You've got to have spent so much time with God that this dust is pouring over you and it's not awkward to share what that means, to bring glory to God's name based on what He's done for you. Psalms 96, continuing on in verse 4. 
For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and glory are in His sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. And as witnesses, these should be the things that are consuming our thoughts. That They should be so in, in, in wrapped up in how we're doing life and in our hearts that it, it becomes second nature to us. We understand what God has done for us. And we bring glory to His, His, His life and everything he's, that He has changed us overflowing through our lips. So we proclaim the glory of God loudly. Secondly, we proclaim the glory of God in our lives. I love the, the story of the first uh, miracle of Jesus that's recorded at the wedding feast in Canaan, a Galilee. And, you know, it's turning water into the grape juice stuff. And so they're, they're okay, it, that's the way I was raised. Um, but, yeah, turning water in, in, into wine. But what, what's interesting is, is, is Jesus is just kind of a bystander. He's just getting started, and he wants to do it on his terms. Well, guess who's not listening? His mother. His mother comes up and says, uh, you need to do something. We have a problem here, and they, they've run out of wine, and you need to, and he goes, woman, uh, my time has not yet come. Why do you involve me? But yet she says, do whatever he says to do and make it happen. So he's, okay, okay. But what he's saying here is not time for me to show my cards. I know why I'm here. I know what I'm supposed to be about. I can't let that out too quickly. This thing needs to grow. It needs to, to develop. In John chapter 7, we see that Jesus delays going to the feast of the tabernacles. His brothers are kind of skeptical about him, and they're like, if you're who you say you are, you need to go and, 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 and make a public proclamation in the temple and start doing some of these signs that we hear that you're doing. And he says, I'm not ready to go do that. My time has not yet come. He knew that there were those who were trying to kill him. And a chapter later, in John chapter 8, Jesus does confront the Pharisees in the temple, and they're angry with him. And the text says that they want to seize him, but they were unable to do so because its time had not yet come. And what John's doing here is by repeating this phrase over and over, his time hadn't come, his time hadn't come, he's grabbing these individual stories that, that, are kind of, that seem unrelated, but what he's doing is he's giving the clue to us, the readers. Something is happening. This is building. It's building towards a climax. Those that are in the audience don't know that climax is coming, but Jesus does. The one that's saying, my time hadn't come, he knows something, a big showdown is about to happen. And sure enough, it does. In John chapter 12, we, we see all this, this happening. And so it, it's moving towards his sacrificial death on the cross. In John chapter 12 and verse 23, he kind of brings his disciples together. And, and Jesus replied, the hour has come. This time that I tell you in here, it's happening now has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Skip down to verse 27. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. That, that's what I want. I want this cup to pass. No, it was for this very reason that I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You know, sometimes, I, I know I feel guilty of this. Uh, if I'll pray to this, I, I don't know if you do as well. And we read this passage that Jesus knew exactly what he was supposed to be doing. And he gets to this moment of decision. He's like, I, I've got to step in and do this. This is what God's will is for me. Sometimes I just kind of want to stand on the sideline and just go, yes. Thank you, Jesus. I, I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate you being this hero. You, you see what condition your people are in. You, you see our need and how we can't do anything about that. Thank you for stepping into God's will, even though you wanted that cup to pass. Thank you for going to the cross. And man, we couldn't have a relationship with your father if it weren't for you. And, and certainly that's true. But there's more to it. There's more than just 
out of this text calling us just to kind of applaud for Jesus. Let, let's go back and look at the verses that I skipped in John 12, and verse 25. Right after he says, I, I've got to be this kernel that falls to the ground so it can produce many more seeds, he says this, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where's he going? He's going to the cross. And he's saying it's not just enough to say, look at what I've done. You've got to walk with me. And where I am, my servant also will be. If you're with me and you say, I'm of, I'm, I'm, I'm of Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian, you follow in his footsteps, you're going to be a servant right next to me. My Father will honor the one who serves me. He says, not enough to just clap on the sidelines. Jesus bids us to come. He says, allow your life to be this kernel that drops down. Because if you're going to hold on to it, that's all you've got. But if you want to replicate who you are, if you want to fulfill your obligation and your, what God is trying to do to you, you've got to die to yourself and allow that to begin the multiplication process for you to continue what Jesus has done for you. Die in yourself in order for your life to produce many seeds. And this God will be glorified and he will honor those who give their life in service to him. Several years ago, I shared the story of the missionary Jim Elliott and his four fellow missionaries, Ed McCauley and Nate Saint, Roger Yaldron and Peter Fleming, who were killed savagely at the end of a spear trying to reach the Akoa tribe in Ecuador in 1956. And it's been a popular movie that came out in, in book, and so there's, there's been a lot of publicity about this. But in January 2006, author Randy Alcorn had the opportunity to spend some time with Jim Elliott's family, the main missionary that was setting all this up. And they were there at a banquet to mark the 50th anniversary of the martyrdom of Jim and his, his four fellow missionaries. And Randy writes this, there we met Jim's older brother, Bert, and his wife, Colleen, in 1949, years before they went to Ecuador. They became missionaries to Peru. When we discussed their ministry, Bert smiled and said, well, I, I'm here, but I can't wait to get back from furlough, get back to my ministry. Now in their 80s, they are in their 60th year as missionaries, joyfully reaching a people for Christ that until... That weekend, I didn't know anything about them. Bert and Colleen may enter eternity under the radar of the church at, at large, but not under God's. Bert said something to me that day I'll never forget. Jim and I both serve Christ, but serve him differently. Jim was the great meteor that streaked across the sky. Bert didn't go on to describe himself, but I will. Unlike his brother Jim... Bert is a faint star that rises night after night, faithfully crossing the same path in the sky to God's glory. I believe Jim Elliott's reward is considerable, but it wouldn't surprise me to discover that Bert and Colleen's will be greater still. Just a couple that are so consumed with their love of their Heavenly Father, they've given their lives, they've died to themselves, and said our lives are going to be about giving glory to our Heavenly Father because that's what they want to do. Finally, I believe that we're called to give glory to God in our legacy. In our legacy. You know, there comes a time, and a lot of people, and I'll go to lunch and, and talk with different folks, there, there comes a time when it no longer has the same appeal to go out there and just kill it in the work environment, to climb a higher mountain, that advancements and achievements and accolades just don't seem to carry as much weight as perhaps when you were a younger man or a younger woman. It becomes more about the things that are of utmost importance, the things that matter most in life. And for most people, it's about your legacy and your loved ones. What will you leave behind? Oftentimes, as a minister, I'll go talk with people in their deathbeds, and usually when they're at that point, you know, they've already made their peace with God and they're ready to go. And you'll ask about their condition, and they'll kind of quickly change the subject. And what they want to talk about is their family and their close friends and the, those that are going to be left behind. And what is, is troubling on their heart is, is, is they're, they're hoping they've done enough to pass on their faith. They hope by, by their words and their actions 
in kind of the trajectory of their life that they have laid a path for those that are going to be remaining behind because they want them so much to have that same faith. I was reading in John chapter 17 this week, and Jesus had that same prayer. Jesus had that same passion in his heart, wanting those he had invested so much time in to continue this ministry on. And so I'm going to read from John 17, starting in verse 4. And imagine if you're praying this prayer for those that you'll leave behind someday. I brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before the world began. I revealed to you those to whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. Skip down to verse 9. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. And in verse 11, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Isn't that what we want? Our family and our friends, those we care so much about, to love the Lord like we do? What are we doing now to ensure that that prayer will be answered in the way that we hope it will? Hopefully we are setting a course. We're setting a path. And we're, we're making a rut. A rut that's a good rut that we see a well-worn path, a path through Scripture, a path through spending time on our knees that our children and our grandchildren are seeing. That they're seeing what meant the most to them is their time with their Heavenly Father. That's the trajectory that will continue on for generations and generations. In his book, I Almost Missed the Sunset, Bill Gaither says this, describing this kind of lasting legacy. He shares a story about how he and his wife, Gloria, had been a married couple for a few years, and they were both teaching school in his hometown of Alexandria, Indiana. And they were looking for a piece of land. And what they wanted to do, they would saved up a little bit of money. They wanted to buy some, a few acres and, and build a house and, and, and start a family together. And so they're, they're driving around Gaither Shares, and they see this beautiful tract of land, about 15, 20 acres. And he looks out over it, and it has a beautiful stock pond on it and, and green grass, and there's cows grazing. And he says, man, that's a piece of land I'd really like to get. And so they start asking around about it, and they said, oh, well, that belongs to old man Mr. Yule, the 92-year-old banker. And word on the street is he's not going to sell any of his land, even though he owns several parcels around town. Well, Bill and Gloria didn't give up that easy. They decided to drop by the bank and, and talk with Mr. Uh, Yule in person. And even though he was retired, he still came by his office every morning for a few hours. And so they went in and introduced themselves. And uh, when they walked in, he just kind of looked at them over the top of his bifocals, asked who they were, and the Gaithers introduced themselves. And Bill said, I'm interested in this little tract of land just south of town. And Mr. Yule interrupts and says, not selling. He said, I promised to a farmer for grazing. Bill said, well, I've, I've, I've heard that, but I wanted to let you know my wife and I are, are here. We're going to be invested in this community, and, and, and we want to give back and do all that we can. So I don't know if that would make a difference in your decision or not. Well, the old banker pushed, kind of pursed his lips, and he stared at him, and he said, what would you say your name was? He said, Bill Gaither. Hmm, any relation to Grover Gaither? I said, yes, sir, that, that was my grandfather. He said he was the most honest employee he had ever had that worked on his farm. He put in an honest day's work for a full day's pay. Mr. Yule said he'd think about it for him to drop by in a couple of days. Sure enough, Bill Gaither dropped by. And when he returned, the banker informed the young man that he had had the property appraised and wanted to know if $3,800 would be a uh, a fair amount. So he got to thinking to himself, well, 15, eight, boy, that's close to $60,000. And he didn't have that kind of money. And he just kind of said, $3,800? He goes, yep, 15 acres, $3,800. Well, he, he knew that the land was worth 
five or ten times that amount. So he gladly said that he would do it. And Gaither writes, he said, nearly three decades later, my son and I strolled on that beautiful, lush property that had once been pasture land. Benji, I said, you had this wonderful place to grow up through nothing that you've done, but because of the good name and a great granddad that you never met. That's what a legacy is about. That's about setting a course for your family and setting a course for those that you care about to glorify God with everything that's in you. You know, when people are around you, does it come natural for the things that come from your lips to just overflow from your heart about bringing glory to God? Is your life, can people tell by your passions how, how you're uh, spending your, your time, your thoughts, your efforts? Are they consumed with bringing glory to God and expanding His kingdom? What about your legacy? Have you set that trajectory to where all can follow? Follow Jesus and glorify God. This morning, we want to offer an invitation. And, and perhaps this is the day that you want to come across your lip that I want Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. We'd love to baptize you. We, we would love for you to start that this new year with giving your life completely to God and walk in newness of life. Perhaps you've already professed the name of Jesus, but if you look at glorification, you're looking at your life, you haven't been about glorifying God's name. We'd love for you to come and confess your sins and start afresh. Or perhaps you're looking at your legacy and you're worried about those to come after. We'd love to pray with you and pray with those that you, you're worried about. Whatever your needs are, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing. And as you're standing, would you take a moment of silence as we consider the glory of God through the things that Brad has shared and our need to glorify him. Let's, let's think about these things for just a moment this morning.